Due to the graphic nature of this woman's crimes, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes discussions of violence, arson, and murder that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for children under the age of 13. Employees at Wall's department store in Duluth, Minnesota, were used to seeing 12-year-old heiress Marjorie Congdon. She frequently came into the store alone for shopping sprees, but today was different. Marjorie's mother, 50-year-old Elizabeth Congdon, had called the store managers that morning to request they stop selling to her daughter unless she was present. Apparently, Marjorie had a bad habit of stealing money out of Elizabeth's purse. When Marjorie came into Walls and attempted to buy several cashmere sweaters, an apologetic cashier refused to ring them up. He explained that he had new instructions from management. It wouldn't do to anger a wealthy client like Elizabeth Congdon. Marjorie simmered. She didn't like rejection. She also didn't mind making a scene. She screamed at the embarrassed employees who denied her service. That night, after the store closed, a small fire ignited in the basement. The alarms went off early enough that the fire department was able to put it out without damaging the store. At the time, nobody could determine what ignited the flames. It was only later, when Marjorie Congdon was outed as a serial arsonist, that anyone made the connection between the girl's tantrum and the dangerous fire it sparked. In spite of a privileged childhood where she never wanted for anything, Marjorie Congdon was a troubled young woman. As an adult, she married three times. Her second husband, Roger Caldwell, was eventually convicted of murder after the violent death of Marjorie's mother, Elizabeth. Roger long maintained that Marjorie committed the murder herself and framed him. Some suspect that Marjorie manipulated Roger into killing her mother, but this has never been proven. Like her husband, Marjorie was tried for her mother's murder, but she was found not guilty. After her acquittal, Marjorie was a suspect in three other mysterious deaths, but never went to trial. She was, however, eventually convicted for fraud and multiple times for arson. This week, we'll explore Marjorie's early life. We'll break down the events that led to her first alleged murder and the subsequent trial. We'll also explore how Marjorie was then emboldened to escalate her violent behavior. Next week, we'll explore Marjorie's third marriage and the string of mysterious deaths that followed her. We'll delve into the factors that allowed Marjorie to continue avoiding convictions even in cases where the evidence of her guilt appeared clear-cut. Marjorie Congdon was born on July 14, 1932, on the East Coast, possibly in New York, although some sources say it was Tarboro, North Carolina. Little is known about her birth mother, except that she was unwed. When she was three months old, she was adopted by 38-year-old Elizabeth Congdon, an heiress to a mining fortune. Some rumors suggest that Marjorie's adoptive mother and birth mother were the same woman, and the adoption was just a polite fiction to protect Elizabeth's reputation, but there's no evidence to confirm this. Elizabeth didn't inform any of her family or friends of her adoption plans until after she came home to Duluth, Minnesota with the baby girl. She was unmarried, which made her a surprising choice of adoptive mother in the 1930s. However, she had resources. Heir to the fabulous Congdon Taconite fortune, Elizabeth demonstrated that she could easily provide for a baby, husband or not. Vanessa is going to take over on the psychology from here. Please note, Vanessa is not a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist, but she has done a lot of research for this show. Thanks, Sammy. A paper titled New Family Structure Study by sociologist Mark Regneris compared single mothers to traditional two-parent households. As adults, children raised by single mothers were more likely to need therapy, less likely to pursue higher education, and generally struggled to form healthy relationships. 
While economic disadvantage was one factor in these children's lifestyle, even children of financially stable mothers tended to suffer some ill effects. Elizabeth raised Marjorie in the massive Glen Sheen Mansion, a sprawling three-story, 39-room home on the shore of Lake Superior. In 1935, when Marjorie was three, Elizabeth adopted again. Marjorie's new baby sister was named Jennifer. Even as a child, Marjorie struggled to connect with other people. She wasn't close to her sister or other family members, and she rarely made friends at school. The staff at Glensheen found it strange that even as a young girl, Marjorie ignored her sister to play alone quietly. What she lacked in social relationships, Marjorie made up for with possessions. Elizabeth showered gifts on her daughter, and Marjorie, in turn, grew accustomed to always having what she wanted when she wanted it. Columbia University's Sunia S. Luther explored how affluence impacted children of rich parents. She found that depression, anxiety, and substance abuse were common even among children with economic advantage. In fact, in some cases, wealthy children were more likely to have emotional problems or break the law than traditionally at-risk children. As she got older, Marjorie grew into an emotional adolescent, prone to outbursts. By the time she was 12, in 1944, Marjorie developed a habit of stealing cash from Elizabeth's purse. When Elizabeth caught on to her daughter's thievery, she contacted local shops and ordered them to not sell anything to Marjorie without her permission. Marjorie responded by learning to forge Elizabeth's signature. She signed a fake letter from Elizabeth granting her permission and continued her shopping sprees. According to the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, it's not uncommon for a child to steal as a cry for attention or to try to impress peers. But when stealing becomes a pattern of behavior, as it did for teenage Marjorie, it's often a sign of a deeper emotional disturbance. Marjorie's severe emotional problems were all too clear by the time she was 13 or 14, when Elizabeth bought her a horse named Greyhound. At first, Marjorie loved to go on rides with Greyhound outside the Glen Sheen estate. But after a few months, Marjorie was bored with the horse. She informed Elizabeth that she no longer wanted to care for Greyhound. Days later, one of the Congdon's employees entered the stables to find Marjorie forcefully shoving oats into Greyhound's mouth. He said, hey Marjorie, Greyhound doesn't look all that hungry right now. Startled, Marjorie dropped the oats. She stared at the employee, wide-eyed and nervous. And then, without a word, Marjorie ran out of the barn. The employee cleaned up the oats, only to find several dozen pills mixed in with the horse's food. He didn't know what kind of pills they were, but the employee had his suspicions. Marjorie was trying to poison her horse. The employee immediately reported what he discovered to Elizabeth. But as was habitual for the heiress, she heard him out and then handled the matter quietly. Greyhound was placed with a new owner, and the employee never learned if Marjorie was confronted about her actions. After the horse poisoning incident, Elizabeth enrolled Marjorie in a Massachusetts boarding school. Initially, Marjorie's grades improved, but she still struggled to make friends. When Marjorie returned home during a break, she resumed her habit of stealing money from Elizabeth's purse. It was then that Elizabeth realized she needed to take more drastic steps to bring Marjorie in line. In 1949, when Marjorie was 16, she was committed to Kansas's Menninger Clinic. There, she received a diagnosis. Marjorie Congdon was a sociopath. According to the DSM, sociopathy is an outdated term for a condition now known as antisocial personality disorder, or APD. People with APD have few or no reservations about lying, cheating, or manipulating others to get what they want. According to the Mayo Clinic, the cause of APD is unknown, but it's believed to arise due to a combination of genetics and an unstable childhood environment. 
APD cannot be cured, but the proper application of discipline and therapy can help children manage and control their symptoms before they reach adulthood. Mental illness was even more taboo in 1949 than it is today. So even though Marjorie was lucky enough to have a mother with the wealth and connections to get her proper treatment for her APD, Elizabeth was too afraid of scandal to get Marjorie the help she needed. She thought she could ignore her daughter's troubles and hoped they would go away on their own. Instead, Marjorie's mental illness would get worse and her erratic behavior would turn dangerous. In time, Elizabeth would pay for her mistake with her life. Coming up, Marjorie builds a family and plots to kill her mother. Now, back to the story. In 1949, after a childhood marked by petty crimes and violent outbursts, 16-year-old Marjorie Congdon was diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. When her mother, Elizabeth, learned of Marjorie's diagnosis, she chose not to treat it, wanting to avoid scandal. In 1950, 18-year-old Marjorie enrolled in Washington University in St. Louis. There, she met 24-year-old insurance executive Dick Leroy. They were quickly engaged. On June 30th, 1951, Dick and Marjorie were married in the Glensheen Mansion. Marjorie gave birth less than a year later. She threw herself into her role as a mother and housewife. For years after her marriage, her home in Minneapolis was in a constant state of renovation as Marjorie personally replaced all the fixtures and repainted all the walls. It wasn't enough to have the perfect home. Marjorie also needed to present the perfect family to the world. A friend explained, her children were always dressed like out of a magazine ad, starched and pressed. But behind the scenes, Marjorie was frantic about holding together the picture-perfect family and maintaining appearances was expensive. Dick's modest salary increased when he was promoted to management at his insurance company. In addition, on her 25th birthday in 1957, Marjorie gained access to the trust her mother set up for her. Even still, Marjorie's spending exceeded her means. On one occasion, Marjorie lied to Dick when he confronted her with the credit card bill. She blamed some of the larger charges on her mother. But when Dick contacted Elizabeth, she denied Marjorie's claims. She had her own fortune. She didn't need to borrow money from her daughter. In fact, it was decidedly the other way around. Several times over the years, Elizabeth gifted Dick large sums to help him make ends meet. And while he struggled to stay afloat financially, Dick continued to lose patience with Marjorie's extravagant spending and her lies about where the money went. By 1960, Marjorie and Dick had been married nine years and had seven children. It was then that 28-year-old Marjorie decided she wanted to redecorate their home with authentic 18th century antiques. Dick refused. They didn't have the money. A few weeks after this conversation, Dick and the children came home after Marjorie had been alone in the house. They were astonished to find that all of their furniture had been ripped apart. Marjorie claimed that the family dog had done the damage, but it was clear to Dick that someone had made clean cuts with a knife. Despite Dick's doubts about Marjorie's story, he stood by while she filed a claim with their insurance company. With the payout, Marjorie redecorated in her preferred theme, 18th century antiques. In 1962, 30-year-old Marjorie became obsessed with competitive figure skating. She enrolled all seven of her children in skating lessons and the family's debt exploded as Marjorie purchased equipment and costumes and traveled all over the state for competitions. Just as Marjorie had been fixated on her house, she was also consumed by her children's competitive edge. She permitted her children to cut class to get in more practice time. When the school threatened to charge them with truancy, she allegedly bribed the administrators. Additionally, she harshly heckled other competitors who rivaled her own children's success. 
On one occasion, a young girl's skates went missing right before she was supposed to compete against Marjorie's daughter. Another time, a front-runner skater was in a severe accident after someone allegedly tampered with his skates, dulling the edge so he'd have less control. In both instances, Marjorie's children secured victories after their competitors were eliminated. Through all this, Marjorie's husband, Dick, grew to believe that the competitive skating was harming his children. He worried that they were taking the wrong lessons from Marjorie's cutthroat tactics. He also suspected that some of his children wanted to quit, but feared saying so because Marjorie would lash out. As time went on, Dick grew increasingly convinced that Marjorie didn't have her children's best interests at heart. On April 29, 1971, after 20 years of marriage, Dick filed for divorce. Marjorie was 39. She couldn't imagine losing her picture-perfect family and having to rebuild everything from scratch. Shortly after the divorce, Marjorie and Dick's house caught fire and burned to the ground. An extensive investigation led the police to suspect Marjorie had burned it down herself, but they couldn't charge her due to a legal loophole. Marjorie never filed an insurance claim, and at the time there was no law against destroying her own property so long as she didn't financially benefit from it. After Marjorie lost her home, she relocated to Colorado. By this point, most of her seven children were adults, but four teenagers continued to live with her. More family struggles would soon follow. Marjorie's adoptive mother, Elizabeth Congdon, suffered a severe stroke at the age of 71. She survived, but the right side of her body was completely paralyzed. In November of 1973, Marjorie went to visit her mother. She brought a jar of homemade marmalade with her. This was an odd choice of a gift as Elizabeth was diabetic and couldn't eat something as sugary as marmalade. But Marjorie insisted that Elizabeth share a marmalade sandwich with her. When Elizabeth declined, citing her dietary restrictions, Marjorie pushed the issue. Finally, Elizabeth's nurse intervened. She didn't want to see a fight break out, so she assured Elizabeth that it was okay to eat one small sandwich. Marjorie prepared the sandwiches and then sat and ate with her mother. After the meal and a brief conversation, Marjorie left. She took the remaining marmalade with her. That night, Elizabeth slipped into a coma. When her nurse arrived the next morning, she was frightened to find that Elizabeth wouldn't wake up. By the time a doctor arrived, Elizabeth was awake but confused. Her blood pressure and pulse were dangerously low. The doctor took a blood sample to try to determine what had caused the episode. Tests showed that Elizabeth suffered from an overdose of a tranquilizer called meprobamate. Elizabeth's nurse remembered Marjorie's insistence that Elizabeth eat a marmalade sandwich. But by now, the sandwiches and the marmalade were long gone, and there was no way to test for poison. Marjorie must have been devastated to learn of Elizabeth's recovery. She even reportedly told a friend she was disappointed not to receive her greatly needed inheritance. For her entire life, Marjorie had blamed Elizabeth for all of her problems. She believed she'd be free with Elizabeth's death. Dr. Donald W. Black of the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine explained in an interview that people with APD tend to externalize guilt. Even when caught doing something wrong, a person with APD will blame their victims for creating a situation where the wrongdoer feels compelled to harm them. While she grappled with her mother's recovery, the divorced Marjorie also concluded that she didn't like being single. She missed being a housewife. In 1976, 44-year-old Marjorie started attending meetings hosted by Parents Without Partners, a group for single parents. There, she met Roger Caldwell. Roger was a raging alcoholic, and his uncontrolled drinking was a major factor in his first divorce. It also led him to lose custody of his children. Marjorie and Roger had both weathered failed marriages and found a kindred spirit in each other. 
They married on March 20th, 1976, only two months after they met. Just as Marjorie's unhindered spending drove a rift between her and her first husband, soon Marjorie and Roger found themselves deep in debt. Their new marriage strained under financial pressure. In addition, Marjorie grew fed up with Roger's drinking. In early June of 1977, she convinced a doctor to write her a prescription for a drug called Antabuse. It's not clear what the official reason was for her prescription, but Marjorie didn't take the pills herself anyway. Antabuse reacts poorly with alcohol. If a patient mixes the two, he'll experience symptoms that are very similar to a heart attack, and the reaction can be fatal. Every morning, Marjorie made Roger take Antibuse with his breakfast. He knew that if he drank while he was on the medicine, he would get very sick and that he might die. The pills gave him the extra incentive he needed to finally get sober, at least for a few weeks. With Roger's drinking problem temporarily solved, Marjorie turned her attention to her money issues. On June 16, 1977, 45-year-old Marjorie hired an attorney to investigate legal issues related to the Congdon estate. Marjorie wouldn't inherit until Elizabeth's death. Her attorneys hadn't heard of any sudden change in Elizabeth's condition, and they wondered at Marjorie's sudden interest in the state of her inheritance. But they went to work per her instructions. A few weeks later, on June 24th, Marjorie called another lawyer. She wanted to update her will. If she died or was injured, she wanted Roger to receive half of Marjorie's inheritance from Elizabeth. On June 26th, Roger flew to Minneapolis. At the airport, he rented a car, then allegedly drove two and a half hours north to Duluth, where Elizabeth lived. That night, an intruder broke a window in Elizabeth Congdon's home. The sound didn't wake Elizabeth, and the intruder was able to enter the house unimpeded. As they climbed the stairs to Elizabeth's bedroom, the intruder encountered Elizabeth's nurse, Velma Pietela, on the staircase. When they spotted one another, the intruder attacked Velma, striking her with a candlestick. The blow left Velma stunned. She fell onto a window seat and sat down, but her attacker didn't relent. They struck her again and again, ultimately bludgeoning the nurse a total of 23 times with the candlestick. Once Velma was neutralized, her attacker crept into Elizabeth's bedroom, where she was asleep. She may have awakened, but she didn't have an opportunity to scream before the intruder pressed a satin pillow over her face. After killing the old woman, the intruder raided the jewelry box. They stole several pieces of jewelry and an antique gold coin. Then they drove away from Glensheen Mansion in Velma's car. They didn't stop driving until they reached the Minneapolis airport parking lot. The next morning, June 27th, Elizabeth's day nurse, Mildred Garvey, arrived to relieve Velma. The first thing she saw when she entered the mansion was Velma's legs hanging off the window seat on the stairs. This didn't alarm Mildred. She assumed the night nurse had laid down for a brief nap. But as she got closer, Mildred realized that her first instinct was dead wrong. Barefoot and covered in blood, Velma wasn't just napping. Mildred lifted Velma's arm to take her pulse. She could already tell Velma was dead from her clammy skin and limp arm. Mildred ran into Elizabeth's room to check on her. She confirmed that Elizabeth, too, had died during the night. Her bedsheets were disarrayed, suggesting a struggle. Mildred sprinted back down the stairs just in time to see Elizabeth's maid arriving for the start of her shift. Mildred announced that Miss Congdon was dead. This didn't surprise the maid, who was well aware of Elizabeth's advanced age and health issues. She said, heart attack, probably. Mildred replied, no, she's been murdered, and Velma is dead, too. As the maid began to panic, Mildred dialed 911 to report what she'd seen. Soon, the police arrived. The same morning, Elizabeth's youngest adopted daughter, 
42-year-old Jennifer received a phone call that her mother had been murdered. The first words out of her mouth were, Marjorie did it. Next, we'll explore the investigation into Elizabeth Congdon's death. Now, back to the story. On June 30th, 1977, 45-year-old Marjorie Congdon Caldwell, her sister Jennifer, and other mourners hosted a private service at Glen Shane Mansion. While the family wanted to keep the funeral small, press gathered outside the estate. 83-year-old Elizabeth Congdon's murder was a big story, and reporters wanted to catch whatever details they could about the family's grief. Meanwhile, the police were closing in on Marjorie's husband, Roger Caldwell, as their top suspect. The police knew he'd flown to Minnesota the same day Elizabeth was murdered. They had also intercepted a mail envelope postmarked from Duluth and addressed to Roger. It contained the gold coin that had gone missing from Elizabeth's home. The envelope was printed with the logo of the Radisson Hotel, the same hotel Roger checked into the night Elizabeth died. Even more compelling, the police were able to pull a fingerprint from the envelope that matched Roger's. Marjorie and Roger stayed in Minnesota at least a week after Elizabeth's funeral. On July 5th, 1977, the police searched their hotel room at the Holiday Inn in Bloomington. Police found jewelry and several other items that fit the exact description of what had gone missing from Elizabeth's room. It was almost a little too easy to connect Roger to Elizabeth's death. Meanwhile, Roger began drinking again, even while he continued to take antabuse. It had been too much to expect the raging alcoholic to quit cold turkey, especially while he dealt with the stress of Elizabeth's funeral. On the evening of July 6th, one night after the police searched Roger's hotel room, he collapsed and checked into a hospital. The next day, July 7th, Roger went from a hospital bed straight to handcuffs. He was charged with murdering Elizabeth Congdon. While police zeroed in on Roger as a suspect, Marjorie's children and her sister, Jennifer, had other suspicions. In September 1977, the family filed a civil suit against Marjorie. They charged her with killing Elizabeth and demanded the entirety of her inheritance. Marjorie contested the charges, launching what would become a multi-year lawsuit. But meanwhile, she couldn't receive her greatly needed $8 million inheritance. While she fought for her money, Marjorie remained broke and in debt after years of compulsive spending. When Roger's murder trial began, his legal team argued that he was framed. They didn't have any theories about who'd done the framing, but the evidence was clear. It made no sense to steal Elizabeth's jewelry, take it home to Colorado, then carry it back to Minnesota with him for the funeral. The only reason to do that was if he'd intended for the police to find the evidence, or if someone else planted it in his room for the police to find. Roger's lawyers also questioned why Roger would go to all the trouble of killing Elizabeth, stealing a gold coin, and then mailing it to himself, leaving a paper trail. It made it a little too convenient for investigators to pin the crime on Roger. The jury didn't buy the story about a conspiracy to frame Roger. They found him guilty and sentenced Roger to two life sentences for his two murders. Marjorie was shocked when, on July 11th, just three days after Roger's conviction, police arrived at her home with an arrest warrant. From the beginning of his investigation, Chief Prosecutor John DeSanto always suspected that Marjorie plotted Elizabeth's murder with Roger. As he explained in his autobiography, we always believed, and the whole theory of the case was, that she was the woman behind the man. Now that DeSanto had secured Roger's conviction, he wanted to go after the big fish. He was convinced that Marjorie had planted the damning evidence so her husband would take the fall, and he was going to make sure Marjorie didn't get away with her crime. 
In July of 1978, Marjorie Congdon Caldwell stood trial for two counts of murder and two counts of conspiracy to murder. The press went wild over the new wrinkle in the case, and Marjorie discovered that she loved the attention they paid her. In spite of her lawyer's instructions not to give statements, Marjorie regularly chatted with journalists before and after her trial and during recesses. The 46-year-old mother was soon a favorite with the press and the jury. Marjorie baked a chocolate cake and brought it to court to share with a lawyer on his birthday. She brought a knitting project from home, which she worked on during the trial. Whatever was going on under the surface, on the outside, Marjorie looked like a harmless portrait of domesticity. According to the Mayo Clinic, people with APD can be very charming when they want to be. As a result, they're often skilled manipulators, quite adept at cultivating the image they want to project. Outside of the courtroom, Marjorie lost some friends, but others came forward to support her. She especially relied on Wally and Helen Hagen, a couple she'd known for decades. Wally and Helen never believed that Marjorie could kill her own mother. Marjorie's murder trial lasted for four months. At that time, the longest murder case in Minnesota history. On June 21st, 1979, the judge issued his verdict. Marjorie Congdon was acquitted on all four counts of murder and conspiracy to murder. The mild-mannered, cake-baking, knitting housewife had struck a chord of sympathy with the jurors, who couldn't bring themselves to convict such a sweet woman. A study conducted by the University of Nebraska's Brian H. Bornstein and E.D. Green explained that jurors will often compare witness testimony to their own personal experiences and beliefs. Then, when weighing conflicting information, jurors will tend to sympathize with testimony and evidence that fits their own preconceived notions. In Marjorie's case, that meant that she was able to appeal to jurors' notions of femininity and motherhood. She reminded jurors of the harmless women in their own lives, and as a result, it seemed impossible that sweet Marjorie Congdon Caldwell could be a murderer. On June 21st, Marjorie stepped out of the courthouse a free woman. When a reporter asked her how she would celebrate, Marjorie answered that she planned to go to White Castle. Plenty of prosecutors weren't falling for her act, but without a conviction, there was nothing more they could do. Officially, Marjorie was nothing but a harmless woman who'd lost her dear mother to her husband's greed. During the first five years of Roger's prison sentence, Marjorie only visited him once. That would make sense if she really believed he'd killed her mother. But in Marjorie's occasional statements to the press, she continually emphasized that she believed he was innocent. According to the DSM-4, people with APD have little or no concern for the well-being of others and are willing to lie or manipulate to get what they want. People with APD rarely feel remorse for their actions. In other words, if Marjorie really did conspire with Roger to murder Elizabeth, she didn't feel bad about it afterward, nor did she feel any loyalty to Roger now that he was of no use to her locked away behind bars. The date isn't known, but at some point after her trial, Marjorie and her friend Wally Hagen began to have an affair. She wanted to forget her old life and start over again with Wally. But there were two problems. First, Marjorie was still legally married to Roger Caldwell. They weren't regularly speaking, but Marjorie never got around to filing for a divorce. The second problem was that Wally, too, was still married, and divorce simply wasn't an option for him. His wife, Helen, had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. In 1979, after Marjorie's trial concluded, she'd relocated to assisted living, where she had access to a full team of nurses and doctors. One day, Helen's daughter Nancy visited her at the assisted living facility. It was one of Helen's good days, and the pair sat together and chatted. During their conversation, Helen voiced her suspicions that Wally was having an affair with Marjorie. But Nancy knew that paranoia was one of the symptoms of Alzheimer's, so she ignored Helen's concerns. 
Then, on March 26, 1980, Marjorie paid Helen a visit. At some earlier point, Marjorie had convinced the staff that she, at 47 years old, was the daughter of 64-year-old Helen. So when Marjorie arrived late in the evening to see her mother, the staff led her to Helen's room without question. During Marjorie's visit, one nurse noticed her feeding Helen something out of a jar. The nurse didn't think anything of it at the time. She had no way of knowing that seven years before, Marjorie had allegedly fed her mother poisoned marmalade. That murder attempt had failed, but Marjorie had learned from her past efforts. The morning after Marjorie's visit, Helen's nurses were unable to wake her. She was in a coma and unresponsive. They called the person listed as Helen's primary point of contact, Marjorie, but there was no answer. Nancy didn't learn of her mother's condition until 10.30 a.m. She was the third person to receive a call from the nursing home, after Marjorie and Wally both failed to answer the phone. Nancy was baffled by the news because her mother didn't have any medical conditions besides Alzheimer's. There was no reason for the mostly healthy Helen to slip into a coma without warning. Helen died on March 30th, 1980, just four days after Marjorie's visit. Her autopsy report said that she died of pneumonia and dehydration. The coroners didn't perform a toxicology examination. Nancy was suspicious. First, Marjorie's mother died right when Marjorie needed the inheritance. And now, after an alleged affair, Marjorie seemed to have eliminated the one rival for Wally's romantic attention. It seemed unbelievable, but Nancy feared that her father was dating a serial killer. Around 11 o'clock on the night of March 24, 1991, Mark Indvik lay awake, unable to sleep, when he heard a noise. He glanced out his window to see his next-door neighbor, Marjorie Congdon Hagen, cutting through his backyard with her dog on a leash. Seeing her in the yard made Mark suspicious. He waited until she was gone, then went outside to retrace her steps. He found a kerosene-soaked rag jammed under his window. Immediately, Mark called the police. Soon after he got the call, Billy Ned of the Pima County Sheriff Department drove to Mark's house. In the two years since Marjorie moved to the tiny town of Ajo, Arizona, about 15 mysterious fires had broken out in the area. If Marjorie really was trying to burn down Mark's house, then Ned might finally have his arsonist. Ned ordered several of his police officers to park up and down Mark's street in unmarked cars. Mark, too, watched from his bedroom, with the lights off, so Marjorie would think he was asleep. Three hours later, Marjorie emerged from her house once more. She lit a match and ignited the rag, still lodged in Mark's window. From his vantage point in an unmarked police car, Ned snapped four photos of Marjorie in the act. Inside, Mark took more pictures, but he forgot to turn off his camera's flash. The light startled Marjorie and she ran away. The police pursued and, in a matter of minutes, Marjorie was under arrest. And yet, Officer Ned barely had an inkling of what Marjorie was capable of. He'd soon discover that Marjorie Congdon Hagen was not only a serial arsonist, she was an alleged serial murderer. Picture a murderer, a gangster, a thief. Did you picture a woman? We didn't think so. Society associates men with dangerous crimes. But what happens when the perpetrator is female? Every Wednesday, we examine the psychology, motivations, and atrocities of female criminals. Hi, I'm Sammy Nye. And I'm Vanessa Richardson. And you're listening to Female Criminals, a ParCast original. This is our second episode on Marjorie Congdon, whose life was dotted with a series of suspicious deaths and fires. 
She was a suspect in five separate murders, crimes for which she's likely to never be convicted of, even to this day. At ParCast, we're grateful for you, our listeners. You allow us to do what we love. Let us know how we're doing. Reach out on Facebook and Instagram at ParCast and Twitter at ParCast Network. And if you enjoyed today's episode, the best way to help is to leave a five-star review wherever you're listening. It really does help. We also now have merchandise. Head to ParCast.com slash merch for more information. Last week, we covered the early life of Marjorie Congdon. At 16, she was diagnosed with an antisocial personality disorder, but never treated. As an adult, she allegedly conspired with her husband, Roger Caldwell, to murder her mother, Elizabeth Congdon. Roger was sentenced to two lifetimes in prison. Marjorie was acquitted. After Marjorie's trial, she struck up an affair with the married Wally Hagen, While Wally's wife was living in an assisted care facility, Marjorie allegedly poisoned her during a visit. Within days, Wally's wife was dead. This week, we'll discuss Marjorie's life after she avoided conviction in three mysterious deaths. Prosecutors have never been able to prove Marjorie had anything to do with killing her mother and her nurse. Likewise, she's never stood trial for the death of her third husband, his first wife, or her late elderly friend. But Marjorie is widely suspected to be a serial murderer. At the age of 47, Marjorie was acquitted of all charges related to the death of her mother on July 21, 1979. But her legal troubles were far from over. For the past three years, she'd been locked in a civil suit with her sister and her own children. They believed Marjorie murdered her mother, Elizabeth, and sued to ensure that Marjorie would never receive her inheritance. Marjorie was also making enemies within her new husband's family. She'd been in an ongoing affair with the married Walter Hagen, but after his wife mysteriously died on March 30th, 1980, Marjorie made an enemy in his daughter, Nancy. Nancy believed that Marjorie killed her mother, Wally's first wife, Helen Hagen. But with only her suspicions to go by, she didn't notify the police. There was no investigation and no charges were ever pressed. If Marjorie had indeed killed Helen, she faced no consequences whatsoever. This was especially dangerous as Marjorie was diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder at the age of 16. Vanessa is going to take over the psychology from here. Please note Vanessa is not a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist, but she has done a lot of research for this show. Thanks, Sammy. Clinical psychologist Margarita Tartakovsky explained in an article that people with APD can learn to abide by societal rules when their actions consistently return appropriate consequences. A criminal with APD is less likely to commit another crime if he or she receives a sentence. But if that person gets away with their transgression, they'll have no reason to change their behavior. A week after his wife's death, Wally dropped by Nancy's home unexpectedly. He announced that he could only stay for a brief time. He was dating Marjorie now, and she was waiting for him out in the car while he spoke with Nancy. Nancy remembered how her mother had suspected an affair between Wally and Marjorie. At the time, Nancy dismissed her mother's suspicions, thinking they were a paranoid symptom of Alzheimer's disease. Now that it was too late, Nancy regretted not giving more weight to Helen's claims. Soon, Marjorie drove a wedge between Nancy and Wally. He'd previously had a warm relationship with his children, but for months, Wally grew distant. Nancy believed Marjorie was turning him against her. Then Nancy noticed that many of her mother's valuables, including her wedding ring, were missing. She was confident that Marjorie had taken them. Nancy also discovered that Wally gave large amounts of money to Marjorie, This was troubling. As Nancy worked multiple jobs to support her father, she was shocked to find that many of his bills were past due while Marjorie enjoyed the fruits of Nancy's labor. 
According to the Merck Manual Entry on Antisocial Personality Disorder, people with APD are often bad with money. Their lack of impulse control means that they often make decisions without considering the long-term impacts. But Nancy could never prove that Marjorie was manipulating Wally and stealing from him. And even when she did occasionally catch Marjorie in a lie, Wally never wanted to hear about it. He'd put his full trust in her. He couldn't be reasoned with, even when his family was convinced that Marjorie was ruining his life. Wally married Marjorie in Valley City, North Dakota on August 7, 1981, a year and a half after Helen's death. Marjorie was 49 years old, 23 years younger than her third husband. The couple told no one of their wedding plans until after they returned from their interstate road trip. Soon afterward, the state of North Dakota charged her with bigamy. She still hadn't filed for divorce from Roger, her second husband, who was serving two life sentences for murder. The bigamy charges weren't a big concern for Marjorie. She and Wally lived together in Minnesota, and bigamy wasn't a serious enough crime for North Dakota to have her extradited. The pair were content to ignore the charges and continue living their lives. Marjorie still remained legally married to Roger while her marriage to Wally wasn't recognized. Marjorie saw no immediate issues with this. Psychiatrist Roxanne Dryden Edwards explained that people with APD often fail to plan ahead or to take responsibility for their own actions. This is a major factor in why so many people with untreated APD commit crimes repeatedly. It's probably also part of the reason Marjorie never bothered to sort out her legal marital issues. In the summer of 1982, 50-year-old Marjorie and 73-year-old Wally decided to move to a lovely lakeside house. In order to afford it, they sold their current residence on September 1st. The buyers, a family called the Larsons, wanted to move in right away, but Marjorie and Wally convinced them to wait so they could finish some last minute renovations. On September 12th, the Larsons entered their new home to review the renovations. They noted that the work was incomplete and shoddily done. In some cases, Marjorie and Wally's changes had actually damaged the house. Strangely, the kitchen smelled strongly of gasoline. On the morning of September 15th, the day that the Larsons planned to move in, the structure caught fire. A neighbor first spotted the smoke at 6.30 a.m. By that point, the house was already engulfed in flames. He said, it was damp and rainy, I remember. And I thought, gee, that's kind of funny. Within 15 minutes, firefighters arrived at the scene. As they fought the flames, they noticed how quickly the fire spread. Typically, an empty house takes longer to burn because it lacks furniture and other flammable materials that serve as kindling. But on this wet, rainy day, the empty house soon became an inferno. In spite of the firefighters' best efforts, they were unable to save the structure. That afternoon, after the fire was finally extinguished, the fire marshal's investigators found crumpled newspapers near the fireplace, where the blaze had originated. When the Larsons reported on the gasoline they'd smelled earlier, it was clear to investigators what had happened. Someone intentionally burned down the Larsons' house. Coming up next, we'll discuss Marjorie's arson charges. Now back to the story. In September 1982, 50-year-old Marjorie Congdon Hagen sold her home. The same day the new homeowners were supposed to move in, the house burned to the ground. It appeared to be a case of arson, and police immediately zeroed in on Marjorie as their top suspect. An article titled Fire Setting, Arson, Pyromania, and the Forensic Mental Health Expert said that serial arsonists are often diagnosed with APD. A separate study titled Arson, a Disorder of Impulse Control noted that arson is often associated with poor impulse control, one of the main symptoms of APD. In the weeks after the fire, Marjorie Congdon Hagen repeatedly called her insurance company to try to claim the payout from the fire. 
However, when the house burned down, it already belonged to the new buyers, the Larsons. Marjorie had no valid claim, and her calls to the insurance company only made her look more suspicious to police. The arson investigation wasn't Marjorie's only legal problem. Her second husband, Roger, was focused on getting out of prison. He had a team of lawyers building a case that it was Marjorie, not Roger, who murdered Elizabeth Congdon. The key to Roger's original conviction was a fingerprint that police pulled from an envelope. Whoever murdered Elizabeth also stole a rare coin from her, then mailed the coin from Duluth, Minnesota to Roger's home in Colorado. In 1977, police pulled Roger's thumbprint from the envelope as evidence that he'd stolen the coin and mailed it to himself. But in 1982, five years after Roger went to prison, a fingerprint expert came forward and claimed that the print on the envelope did not belong to Roger. It's hard to say whether the original fingerprint expert lied or simply made a mistake, but his testimony from the original trial was thrown out. On September 2nd, 1982, Roger was granted a retrial. This was disastrous for John DeSanto, the chief prosecutor in Elizabeth's murder case. The state had already seen their top suspect, Marjorie Congdon, acquitted. If Roger was released as well, they'd be 0 for 2 for convictions. And even if Roger proved Marjorie had killed Elizabeth, she couldn't be charged again due to double jeopardy laws. Plus, DeSanto didn't want to see Roger's appeal go to court, as cases like this were expensive. So he offered a plea bargain. In exchange for a confession, Roger would be released immediately, having already served five years in prison. This way, at least DeSanto could keep the successful conviction on the books. Roger accepted the deal, but continued to maintain his innocence outside of court. He'd only said what he had to to get out of prison. After his release, Roger moved to his hometown of Latrobe, Pennsylvania, and attempted to pick up the pieces of his life. He began dating, but his alcohol-fueled bouts of rage spurred him to beat his girlfriend. He soon had several counts of domestic violence on his record. In addition, Roger struggled to find employment and felt like the local people scorned him. It's hard to find a job or make friends when you're a convicted murderer. Desperate for cash, Roger reached out to Marjorie's sister, Jennifer. He knew Marjorie was still embroiled in the lawsuit with her family. He told Jennifer that he had key evidence that would win the suit. He could prove that Marjorie killed Elizabeth Congdon. Jennifer was intrigued, but cautious. She wanted to settle the lawsuit once and for all. But on the other hand, Roger was a drunk, Elizabeth's confessed killer, and he'd recently been charged with beating up his girlfriend. Jennifer wasn't convinced that she should trust what Roger had to say. She asked Roger what kind of evidence he had, but he refused to answer. His information wasn't free. Jennifer offered $50,000 if Roger could guarantee that his evidence was convictable. Roger countered, asking for at least 100000 At this point, Jennifer balked. Roger walked away from the negotiation table with nothing. To this day, we still don't know what his persuasive evidence was, or if it even actually existed. Roger eventually committed suicide a few years later. In the note found by police, he wrote, I didn't kill those girls or, to my knowledge, ever harm a soul in my life. It was strange for Roger to claim he'd never harmed anyone so soon after his domestic violence arrests, but police didn't question the circumstances too closely. His untimely death proved to be a boon for Marjorie, who no longer had to deal with charges of bigamy. In another ongoing investigation, on January 15, 1983, police obtained a warrant to search Marjorie and Wally's house for any evidence connecting them to the Larson's house fire four months before. Police soon found a flammable varnish that matched what was used inside the house. Then they uncovered records of numerous correspondences between Marjorie and her insurance company. 
Three hours after the search began, 51-year-old Marjorie Congdon Hagen was arrested and charged with second-degree arson and insurance fraud. Marjorie's arson trial began on December 12, 1983. Her trial lasted through Christmas and New Year's. On January 13, 1984, the jurors gave their verdict. Marjorie refused to look at the jury as they announced they'd found her guilty. She was sentenced to two and a half years in prison and fined $10,000. Her lawyer tried to protest. At 51 years old, Marjorie had never been convicted of a previous crime. She was no threat to the community and didn't belong behind bars. This was technically true. Marjorie had been tried for murder, but never convicted. But the judge, familiar with Marjorie's history, upheld the sentence. Marjorie spent 21 months in Shakopee Women's Prison. She was 54 when she was released early for good behavior. In addition, Marjorie finally settled her six-year lawsuit over her mother's estate in 1984. Of her mother's $8 million fortune, half went to Marjorie's sister, Jennifer. Two and a half million were split between Marjorie's children, and the remaining one and a half million went to Marjorie. But it didn't go far, as she had spent more than that in lawyers' fees. After her release from prison, Marjorie and Wally Hagen moved to Ajo, Arizona. Soon, local firefighters saw a sharp uptick in the number of fires in the area. The evidence pointed to arson, but investigators had no leads about the identity of the fire starter. Then on March 24, 1991, Marjorie's neighbor, Mark Invick, broke the case wide open. He caught Marjorie trying to burn down his house while he was inside. When she was arrested, police found matches in Marjorie's pocket. The next day, police searched Marjorie's home and found kerosene lanterns and rags that were identical to the one jammed in Mark's window. Once again, 59-year-old Marjorie was charged with arson. In light of how many of Marjorie's other neighbors had been victims of recent fires, police believed Marjorie was a pyromaniac. The Minds Behind the Fire by journalist Melanie Ben Cosme identified numerous possible motives for serial arson. In addition to arson for profit, other motives include revenge and pyromania, a psychological fascination with fire. Burning down Mark's home wouldn't benefit Marjorie financially, but given her incendiary pattern of behavior, she may well have grown obsessed with the thrill of committing arson. When the case eventually went to trial, Marjorie tried to explain away her behavior. She claimed that she was only in Mark's backyard because her dog needed to be walked and she didn't want to be on a public street so late at night. Marjorie said that Mark's house was already on fire when she took the shortcut through his yard. She ran away because she was scared. Marjorie insisted that she was the victim of a frame-up. She claimed the police knew about her past history and planted the matches on her. She also repeatedly referenced her poor health. Arthritis made it impossible for her to light matches. Failing eyesight meant she needed kerosene lamps to see in her dark home. She was far too infirm to open Mark's window and shove a kerosene-soaked cleaning rag inside. Years earlier, during Elizabeth Congdon's murder trial, Marjorie had learned how to manipulate a jury's sympathy. Now, 14 years later, she wasn't so successful. On October 29, 1992, the court found the 60-year-old guilty of attempted arson. As a repeat offender, Marjorie stood to receive a much lengthier sentence. And then there was the fact that homeowner Mark Indvik was inside the house when Marjorie lit the fire. The attempted murder bumped her charges up to a class two felony. That too meant the judge would be harsh with her. Marjorie was sentenced to 15 years in prison. She countered that her husband Wally was in poor health and needed a full-time caretaker. The judge granted Marjorie a 24-hour reprieve before the start of her sentence. At one o'clock that afternoon, 
a police officer smelled gas as he walked past Marjorie's home. He checked in with Marjorie to see if everything was okay, and she explained that she'd just been cooking lunch on her gas stove. Three hours later, Marjorie called Wally's son. Wally had passed away. Earlier that day, Wally had complained he was feeling fatigued and laid down for a nap. When Marjorie went to check on him a few hours later, she discovered that he was dead. Wally's son asked if Marjorie had called the police yet. Marjorie said nothing in reply. Her refusal to answer left a pit in Wally's son's stomach. After their conversation ended, he immediately called the Tucson Police Department to inform them of the suspicious circumstances of his father's death. Investigators arrived at the scene to find Marjorie ready with a supposed suicide note from Wally. The police entered the note into evidence, but they weren't ready to accept it was real. Her behavior was all too suspicious, and suicide didn't match the story Marjorie reported to Wally's son. They still needed to review the scene of Wally's death. Their investigation returned a cut hose, coiled up outside the house. Police brought the hose inside and found it was the perfect length to connect from the gas stove to her bedroom. Investigators then questioned Marjorie's friends and neighbors. One witness testified that they'd seen Marjorie bring the hose inside her house earlier that day. The evidence was clear. Marjorie had intentionally asphyxiated Wally with gas. But Marjorie tried to explain it all away per usual. She told the police that she couldn't handle life in prison and her husband couldn't live without her. So they'd made a mutual suicide pact. According to Marjorie, she and Wally were both supposed to asphyxiate on the gas. Wally killed himself according to their plan. But when it was Marjorie's turn, she changed her mind at the last minute. The police didn't buy Marjorie's story one bit. The same day Wally died, Marjorie was arrested and charged with second degree murder. But the state didn't have any concrete evidence to prove that Wally hadn't killed himself, as Marjorie claimed. Add that Marjorie was about to go to prison for different charges anyway, and the Ajo Police Department didn't see any point in expending time and resources to prosecute Marjorie. They dropped their charges on November 19, 1993. Wally's murder case never made it to trial. Not only did Marjorie allegedly get away with murder, but the crime paid off financially. Wally's will left everything to his dear wife. Next, we'll discuss Marjorie's time in prison and how she remained legally entangled with Wally's family even after his death. Now, the conclusion of our story. On October 30th, 1992, one day before 60-year-old Marjorie Congdon Hagen was supposed to begin a 15-year prison sentence for arson, her husband, Wally Hagen, died under highly suspicious circumstances. Wally's children and the police all believed that Marjorie had murdered her husband, but a lack of evidence and Marjorie's looming prison sentence led police to drop the charges against her. Marjorie received her inheritance and got away scot-free. Nancy and Wally's other children didn't contest his will, but they did sue for control of Wally's body. They wanted him buried in the same plot as his first wife, Helen. Behind bars, Marjorie hired a lawyer to counter their suit. She insisted that she had a greater claim to Wally's body as his widow. Nancy's lawyer countered that because of anti-bigamy laws, Marjorie and Wally were never legally married. While the civil trial was going on, Wally's children took their fight to the press. In an interview with the St. Paul Pioneer Press, they suggested that Marjorie was complicit in the deaths of both of their parents. But ultimately, the lawsuit was long, expensive. Wally's family was forced to settle. Marjorie agreed to receive half of Wally's body. He was cremated and his ashes were split. Nancy and the other children buried their half of the ashes with their mother. 
While Marjorie fought with the outside world, she seemed to find peace behind bars. She got along well with her fellow inmates. In fact, she was an ideal prisoner. According to Harvard Medical School, people with antisocial personality disorder don't see much value in following rules. However, if they're incentivized, say by fear of punishment, people with APD can adapt and behave according to societal norms. It seems that Marjorie determined that the best way to cope with her sentence was to get through it as cleanly and quickly as possible. On January 5th, 2004, after serving 12 years of her 15-year sentence, Marjorie was released. She was 72. Ordinarily, a woman of her age would put her criminal past behind her and attempt to build a new life. But Marjorie never was an ordinary woman. Dr. Saba Matar and psychiatrist Farooq Khan studied elderly patients with personality disorders, including APD, in their paper, Personality Disorders in Older Adults, Diagnosis and Management. They found that often society expects older patients to grow out of their personality disorders, but in actuality, symptoms can actually become more severe as patients age. In 2004, 72-year-old Marjorie moved to Tucson's Coronado Place condo community. There, she met Roger Samus, a septuagenarian who resided in a nearby assisted living facility. The two formed a fast friendship, bonding over their love of Marjorie's new pet greyhound, Blueberry. She eventually convinced Samus to grant her power of attorney over his finances. By early 2007, Marjorie handled all of Roger's personal affairs, including managing his bank account. Weeks later, on March 1st, 2007, Samus passed away suddenly. Marjorie rushed to have his body cremated before an autopsy could be performed. Her power of attorney privileges allowed her to legally make this determination without consulting his family. No cause of death was ever determined. Four days after Samus's death, Marjorie tried to transfer $11,000 in funds to her own personal account, but the transaction raised a red flag at Samus's bank and was halted. Marjorie claimed that she didn't realize she lost her legal authority over Samus's finances after his death. She believed she still had the right to transfer his money to her account. On March 22, 2007, police arrested 74-year-old Marjorie on charges of fraud and forgery. When Marjorie was charged, the Greyhound Adoption Agency took back Marjorie's beloved Blueberry. She tried to sue the group for custody of the dog, but a judge threw out her case. That was probably better for Marjorie, who had a higher stakes trial to prepare for. Her long and storied criminal history meant that Marjorie could no longer convincingly play the part of a kindly housewife. Unable to rely on a jury's sympathy, Marjorie accepted a plea bargain in November 2008. The 76-year-old was sentenced to three years of probation for the forgery and fraud charges. Because police were unable to determine a cause of death for Roger Samus, no charges were ever filed related to his demise. As she resumed her normal life, Marjorie was quiet and kept to herself. Accounts from friends and neighbors suggested that she avoided telling people her full name and never mentioned her colorful history. But as much as Marjorie wanted to disappear, her past kept up with her. The people of Coronado Place anonymously shared books and news stories with one another that detailed Marjorie's alleged crimes. Soon, they all knew the story of Elizabeth Congdon's murder and Marjorie's suspected role in it. According to Marjorie's neighbors, after she lost Blueberry, Marjorie adopted a new greyhound named Raja, which she doted on. Marjorie would take Raja on daily walks, ignoring the community's leash laws. None of her neighbors pressed the issue. They'd read all the newspapers and books and knew what happened to people Marjorie didn't like. 
But Marjorie wasn't entirely scorned. She made friends with a few neighbors who would go on shopping expeditions, meet for coffee, and take long walks around the neighborhood with her. Few of these friends allowed their names to be published as they wanted to avoid the media attention that came with knowing Marjorie. According to Alyssa Ford, writing for Artful Living, Marjorie's probation officers required all of her friends to sign a legal release, acknowledging that they understood and accepted the danger of getting close to a woman like Marjorie. In 2010, Marjorie informed the courts that she'd begun to suffer from unspecified health problems. She was 78. The terms of Marjorie's probation kept her from moving into an assisted living facility. In November of 2010, she filed for a reduction in her sentence so she could live in a nursing home. The judge declined her request. By now, Marjorie's manipulative behavior was well known and well documented. He wasn't going to let himself be played. After the judge's refusal, Marjorie's health took a sudden turn for the better. Her health conditions disappeared almost overnight. At the time of this recording, Marjorie is 87 years old. It's been nearly a decade since the end of her probation, and Marjorie has never resided in an assisted living facility. According to her friends and neighbors, the 87-year-old is very independent and in good health and spirits. She still lives in Coronado Place. Today, Marjorie's childhood home, Glen Sheen Mansion, is owned by the University of Minnesota Duluth. The university opened the mansion to tours so guests can see the finery that the Congdon family surrounded themselves with in life and question tour guides about the murders that took place there. Marjorie Congdon's life has been chronicled in numerous books. On stage, St. Paul's History Theater in St. Paul, Minnesota, ran the comedy Glensheen for many years, ringing music and laughs out of the dark true story. To date, Marjorie has never been formally convicted of any murders, nor has she served prison time for anything other than her two arson convictions. Marjorie lived her life without ever receiving treatment for her antisocial personality disorder. If her mother, Elizabeth, had gotten Marjorie the help she needed, perhaps nearly half a dozen murders could have been prevented. Elizabeth Congdon, Velma Pietela, Walter and Helen Hagen, and Roger Samus all might have met very different fates. Instead, Elizabeth's desire to avoid scandal led to as many as five deaths, plus countless fires and instances of fraud. Mental illness creates a ripple that travels outward from the person who's diagnosed. Not only does it harm the afflicted person, but its effects can change the lives of the friends, family, and everyone around the sufferer. And so long as mental health issues are treated as shameful secrets, those who are afflicted, their friends and families, and society as a whole suffer from the silent secret.